I'm really thrilled to introduce to you Gerd Müller. Those of you who are long-term APL conference goers or participants might recall some of Gerd's previous presentations. It's about array logic. Um, he has done several interesting things, including managing the full house audiovisual BNO uh, Bang & Olufsen installations, uh, securing railway stations, making sure that trains won't get a diffused signal when they pass through. This has become a European standard. Um, they have also a configuration tool now that for customers who sell customized product that are available as a product. And the latest thing that Geert has uh, entered into is something about saving life, which he's t going to tell us about, amongst other things, today. So this is APL, raw, brute, and very forceful. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Um, thank you for the uh, introduction and thank you for uh, uh, letting me give you this presentation. Uh, I was asked about the title, uh, A Race in Real Life. And in fact, it has a meaning because, uh, as Gita said, uh, one of the applications I would introduce is uh, within life science genotyping. But uh, generally speaking, my uh, attempt today is to present for you some uh, applications of arrays, some very complex combinatorial problems where the use of arrays and geometry is really the key to the solution. So the agenda I will go for today is first uh, give a very short introduction to the mathematical foundation of these applications, the array-based logic and the geometrical approach to, to logic. Then I'll uh, go through some case stories. First, uh, railroad interlocking systems where the uh, problem is to ensure that the trains do not collide. It's basically a question about constraint resolution, verification. Then I have another uh, regarding product configuration where the technology is used for embedded configuration in, for example, for mobile applications embedded in, in industrial products. And the last application I'll present for you is a very, very exciting, very, very telling application regarding life science applications where we have to do data mining on huge amounts of data uh, with a lot of genes, with a lot of SNPs. This is a new field, completely new, but it is very exciting. And um, uh, regarding the future applications, uh, we see Dialog APL as a very, very important tool for this development. As Gita said, we uh, introduced or we started the company uh, Array Technology back in the mid-90s. Uh, uh, our vision from the very beginning was to develop a technology which could be used in a wide range of business applications. A general constraint in or constraint satisfaction technology which could support any kind of uh, modeling analysis and runtime simulation of any kind of constraint problems on fine domains. Before that, I had uh, made some years study in array-based logic at the Technical University of Denmark, uh, where it had been a very close cooperation also with IBM Cambridge Scientific Center and uh, Dr. Tracer Moore on array theory. And uh, after that project with the railroads, we continued with uh, various kinds of product configuration. Uh, and uh, the design of the technology at that time was to use it for embedded solution that is used as an OEM component in other kind of products. And then over the last year we have started the life science applications. But all the applications they have one common foundation in this array approach to logic, the geometrical approach to logic. And uh, we have a toolbox today in an APL as well as C++ where you can do any kind of inference processing on arrays we have built our own products, the Array Studio 7 and the Array APIs for these product configuration applications. But uh, the future, as we see it, will be to use Dialog APL and new generation products for very, very large scale constraint problems where you need, need parallel processing. Uh, that's regard to data mining and constraint resolution. Uh, 
uh, we have talked about array-based logic before, and um, there have been some questions regarding the array-based logic. Uh, in fact, the array logic is not limited to propositional logic. It is a general approach where you can handle any kind of measurements on fine domains. The key here is, of course, that the basic truth tables of arrays um, define some symmetries, that is, a mathematical group, so that you can uh, identify some laws on this logic. And we can uh, carry out any kind of inference that's boiled down to just, two, to just three uh, very fundamental array operations. We can then extend this uh, concept to, uh, from propositional logic to predicate logic and relational algebra. And the next step is to use nesting for handling uh, very, very large domains. So you can say uh, the array-based logic is a general constraint solver on fine domains. On top of that, we have designed this uh, constraint engine where it's basically very simple. The first step is to describe the problem. The next step is to solve the problem, that is to determine all solutions. And the final step is to uh, simply use all those solutions for some for embedded applications. The technolo this technology is the first to uh, satisfy all these uh, requirements for completeness, compactness, and real-time capability. Completeness meaning that all constraints must be taken into account to ensure consistency. Compactness is, of course, that we need to have it run on a computer. And the real-time capability is that we want to be able to have real-time responses, even if it's run on a mobile phone or a small client. A very, very simple example. Um, again, this is simple uh, Boolean logic. This is simple uh, propositional logic. Uh, but it's just to illustrate three simple relations, A or B implies C or D. It's the first relation, the second one C implies E, and the second uh, third is D implies E. Each of these relations are compiled into an array representation, representing the valid combinations. And um, if you take a look at the first relation, R0, uh, we have those four variables. And uh, the three rows in the table represents the entire solution space. So that is the first row, 0, 0, 0, 0, is a single combination. And the others are the Cartesian subspaces. That is, the second row represents eight combinations, and the third uh, represents four combinations. Now, we want to satisfy all those rules, all those constraints. So we have to join them or make the conjunction of them. And this is basically a simple join, where we uh, join those three relations in, into a single one. And uh, here we have uh, the uh, output as the complete solution space, A, B, C, D, E. And um, as you can see, uh, now we can use the, all the combinations for other applications, for example, if I make the assertion now that A is true, as a value one, we can simply uh, make a union on each of the uh, columns to identify uh, what, are, what are now the value combinations. We see that E is bound to one or true. If you look at the uh, original relations, it is also obvious to make that conclusion. But uh, if we had not combined those relations, uh, we had to do some search that would be the alternative. Uh, starting from, from the symbolic expressions, we would say, OK, A is true. What can we, can we conclude? Then you have to combine or do some backtracking on the reasons to, to uh, deduce that re result. But our approach is to, to eliminate all constraints and determine the entire solution space. And then the runtime is simple table lookups. Now, of course, we cannot. Uh, do this in general, uh, just uh, joining all the relations into a single relation. But um, in this trivial example, it is possible. It is also possible here to uh, make some kind of uh, rewriting of the relation. We can split it into more relations with common link variables uh, in order to further compress the format. 
there were some questions yesterday uh, regarding what we are doing. If we go back to this, you can see if we are doing uh, the colligation of the join of two relations on the compressed form, it is basically an outer product with an, an intersection. If, for example, we are joining the relations R0 and R1 with a common variable C, we have to make the intersection uh, on each of the possible uh, values for the two columns to identify which columns are now valid. If it, it was expanded into uh, all the combinations, we could simply use the equal operator, but it is, if it is compressed form, we have to use the intersection. And looking at the runtime application or the runtime table lookup, it's also uh, intersection and then union as the basic operations. So it's very, very easy to implement in APL. And this splitting and uh, linking makes it possible to build very, very large uh, tree structures where the entire solution space is not just a single relation, but it could be any kind of tree structure. And that's a way combining the nested form of the Cartesian subspace and this kind of linking makes it possible to, to really build very, very large solution spaces. And now we can have an external state vector, some kind of measurement or assumption from the environment for example, uh, tracking the relation six, the green one, then we can do a propagation in this network. We don't have to do complex search, it is simple state propagation, and we can still guarantee completeness. And that's the way we uh, satisfy the requirement for completeness in real time. If we take a look at the first problem with the railroads, um, the Danish state railroads, they had a very, very uh, significant challenge in, in the mid-90s, um, namely that when they're going to design new interlocking systems, they had to do all this verification more or less manually. They had computer tools, but they were only able to uh, test a small part of the system. And in order to guarantee uh, consistency of the entire system, we have to combine all the constraints so this is an example where we have more than 10,000 variables and a huge state space. And uh, the problem here is, of course, that uh, the combinatorial explosion. The tools available on the market today can uh, test uh, part of the system, but uh, not the entire system. Uh, and they, had did, uh, they did a lot of uh, manually uh, test of this uh, rules, and the uh, requirement was about two many years to, to build a new uh, interlocking system. And what we made here was that we uh, made a tool where uh, the, the designer, he had a cat drawing of the station, and, uh, and that defines the topology of the system. And all the objects, the switches and the signals, etc., are then combined. And uh, each of these components, they had a truth table defining the possible states. And um, these states were then interconnected uh, by the topology. So you can see all the rules here are auto-generated from that CAT drawing. And uh, it is not just the physical constraints, we also have to take into account all the regulations, the rules regarding the safety. And um, all this stuff is uh, then carried out automatically. If you look at the uh, benchmarks here, uh, the number of variables is more than 12,000. The number of relations to begin with is about 4,700. And the compile time to determine the entire solution base is about six minutes using our C++ compiler. In fact, it's running a little bit faster in APL. The interesting thing is that I used APL as a prototyping tool at that time, not as a commercial product, as such. I used APL for prototyping, uh, and uh, I tested on, on the old 8 version 2, uh, where it runs very much faster than the C++. Uh, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, I've not yet tested on, um, on the newest generation of products from, from Dialog, but I think uh, that we can see uh, further improvements. 
Anyway, the output binary file is just 27 kilobytes. So uh, you could see the entire solution space here, you could uh, run it on a mobile phone if you like, or you could uh, use it embedded in, in the electronic equipment controlling the trains. But at that time, it was just an engineering tool. Uh, after we have designed the tools and uh, verified the, the valid train routes, we, um, the, they, they will then implement all the control in, in relays. But the obvious choice in the future would be to take this consistent data model and just plug it into the, the control equipment. Uh, one of the things here, uh, if we dive into the constraint problem here, is that uh, the first generation of the technology, we build this tree structure. But in fact, it's possible to identify some clusters or some relations where we can do the collocation in parallel. This problem is, from the beginning, very, very suitable for parallel processing. And we have not used that capability yet. But uh, to illustrate here, uh, building the uh, solution space here, I have almost completed the tree. But there are four red relations in the kernel, or the root of the tree, which has not been collocated yet. And we have to combine them to verify the consistency. It could be that uh, this uh, will blow up in size. We, we may risk, of course, uh, for some problems that the uh, solution space will blow up, and we cannot complete it. But in fact, it's possible to build these four uh, relations or combine them each at a time in parallel and then link them afterwards. So the natural next step for these kind of constraint problems would be, be to, for example, use the ETO or the PET operator uh, probably on, on four different machines. So here we have a few very, very large tasks with a lot of memory. And I suppose uh, using it on, on a multi-core uh, PC would not make sense. I'm not sure. But probably it would be better to, to run it on four computers. The runtime, very, very simple. 27 kilobytes. And the runtime ending is just 8 kilobytes. Uh, the simple state vector transformation is just equal by. So it could be run on a mobile phone or whatever you like. But it's, of course, a theoretical uh, uh, question to do that. But uh, in principle, it would be possible. A very, very small footprint. So as I see it, these kind of constraint problems, uh, safety critical problems, uh, we want to uh, really ensure completeness and consistency. Uh, Dialog APL and the new generation uh, could very, very much make a difference. The Danish State Railroads, they, uh, that part of that division was later on acquired by Atkins in the UK. So it, in fact, it is now used uh, all over Europe for designing new interlocking systems. Uh, but I know that uh, they have some there are some limitations. There are some very, very large uh, problems, some large interlocking systems, which cannot be completed using this tool, and where the parallel processing capability could be very interesting. <laughs> so that would be the next step for us to uh, divert to into this and then use Starlog and the parallel processing for, for this kind. Now, another case where you also need constraint resolution, but uh, where the importance is not to, whether it's, uh, it's not safety critical, but you need to use the solutions embedded in uh, web solutions on mobile phones or even embedded in the industrial products. We had a case here with Electrolux laundry systems. They are building laundry equipment for for example, for hospitals, or special uh, requirements uh, where uh, there is a lot of variance of that product. And uh, in order to, to make this uh, very efficient, we have to combine data from production, from sales, and uh, to ensure that uh, the order is correct and that the system is optimized. 
And um, all these product families, well, they had uh, the problem with the, the, the process here that uh, from the very beginning when the uh, customer contacted the salespeople and then the uh, life cycle uh, approach where the sales and the, the, um, and the production and the after services were not combined. They had their own configuration tool, which was uh, simply implemented using if-then rules. It was impossible to test the rules for consistency, for example. There were a lot of errors in the, um, in, in the orders, uh, and then they, sometimes they sell uh, products which could not be manufactured. Uh, so uh, the, the key here was to, to um, simply eliminate those constraints or eliminate those problems. The, uh, it was an example of a homemade development, uh, and uh, they wanted to keep the original interfaces, but they wanted another uh, constraint engine. So what was important here is that it was very easy for using the array tool to, uh, to maintain the rules. That was the first requirement that for those defining, those product domain specialists defining the rules, it should be very easy for them to describe rules. Rather than be a programmer doing a lot of if-then programming, uh, they realized that uh, defining the constraints as tables was very easy. Also that these uh, tables could be auto-generated from, say, a relational database. They could reuse the existing data. So uh, the ease of use for the modeler and the ease of use for those doing the implementation, the integration, and the products, that was, the, you can say, the, the key selling point for them. Whether it is complete uh, on this requirements is not that important. Of course, it is easy to eliminate, eliminate most uh, faults already when you define the, the relations or the rules, but uh, that was not the important thing. The important thing was that it was very easy to integrate. So the output here, of course, is that uh, all the quoting, all the contracting stuff, that all the orders are valid and consistent and complete. And uh, the entire sales process is simplified a lot. And uh, you can see uh, the same uh, product knowledge is uh, available for all kind of uh, Departments at, at Alex Lux, it is available for the engineering department, for the salespeople, for the production, and uh, they also now use it uh, for, in fact, for documentation. The, the fact that you need to define your manuals in an easy way, rather than having a standard manual for all customers, you can customize also the manuals. And the latest development is that they want to uh, use uh, the product knowledge embedded in the electronic equipment so that for talking about installation and setup of these products, uh, they can uh, simply use the same product embedded in the laundry equipment using the, this eight kilobyte runtime engine. We have to re-develop uh, it. It is running on an eight or 16 bit uh, controller, so it has to be re-developed. Uh, but this is a special, a special requirement uh, in fact, have we, we have made a, a lot of those kind of customers. Uh, Elix Lux is one example, Teacher Park in Sweden. Here in the US, we have uh, Salmon Bell Communications, which is now an AT&T company, uh, SPX Cooling Technologies. All of these manufacturing and telco applications, they want to, uh, rather than buying a configuration tool from Microsoft or Oracle or SAP, they want simply to, to buy the constraint in it and then simply do the integration themselves, a specific solution. In the case of SBC in, uh, in the US, uh, in fact, they were running ILOC and uh, Selectica, uh, but they had, a, they had problems simply by, it was impossible with those 16,000 rules uh, to, um, to complete the stuff with the existing tools. So they went for, for the array solutions, and it is today used for customer service, it is used for infrastructure, almost like the railroads, uh, when they are 
for example, determining routing on the, on the networks. OK. The next, or the last uh, case here is the most complicated I have ever seen. Uh, all the requirements we know from railroads and etc. is uh, nothing compared with this. Um, here we need constraints, we need uh, deduction, all that stuff, but uh, it is an example with, with very, very complex, with a multitude of combinations. Anybody of you who knows SNPs, SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism? Because there are a few biologists here, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, as you may know, a few years ago, the uh, human genome was identified. And there are about, as far as I remember, three billion um, base pairs in the DNA. About one out of a thousand, about three millions of these are SNPs or variants. There are small variants in the, in the DNA. And that makes us different, look different, etc. And, uh, well, we, we learn in school, for example, that combining the alias of brown and green eyes, that brown eyes is a dominant alias compared with green eyes. So, for example, if the mother has uh, brown brown in her alias and the father has green green, their children will be a mix of brown and green. But since brown is dominant, uh, the the daughter, for example, will be, he, she may have the phenotype with brown eyes, but he still has a genotype with brown and green. And if we then, if she gets a children with a man also with brown, G, uh, green, uh, that could be a mix so that the grandparents get the green eyes again. And that's what we learn in school about genetics and this kind of phenotypes and genotyping. But the problem here is that uh, looking at uh, the human genome, Many people expected that uh, now it would be possible to identify many of these genetic disorders, but it has never been possible. Uh, well, a few, very, very few and rare uh, disorders are found, uh, and they are bound to a single gene or a single SNP. But most of the uh, large disorders, genetic, such as bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, ADHD, or the mental disorders, and then there are diabetes 2 and various cancer types, all of these uh, are simply not, uh, it has not been possible to identify the, the, the genes causing the disorders. We also know, of course, uh, looking at, uh, for example, the uh, high and thin people tend to also have high or tall and, and thin uh, children, but uh, it is very, very much more, more complicated. There are many factors involved not just genetic uh, factors, but also, of course, from the environment. Now, I was contacted a year ago um, from a professor at the Copenhagen University Hospital, Hospital. They had made a study on patients with bipolar disorder, also known as manic depressive disorder. And this is a disorder which uh, it's about 1% of the population who has that uh, disorder. And um, it is very genetic in the sense that if you, uh, if you have the disorder and you have a twin brother or sister, that brother or sister will get the disorder with a likelihood of about 70%. There are still external factors, but um, so it is very genetic and the genes causing the disorder has never been discovered. So that group at uh, the Copenhagen University Hospital has made a study. They had 607 patients and about 1,355 control persons. And for each of all these individuals, they had identified 56 genes. The theory is that the manic phase of mania is caused by unusual high signal transmission speed in the brain. Simply that the uh, signals are uh, propagating too fast. And that's the reason for mania. So it has a biological explanation. And then when you have the depression, it could be that they are going too slow. So they had simply identified those genes uh, involved in, in, the, in the, how the 
the, the signals is transmitted from one neuron to another. And that's, of course, a complex biological process. It's a, you can say it's a system where uh, one cell is building the exome potential and the next one is receiving it. There are many um, biological or physical factors involved. And that could also perhaps be an explanation. So uh, one gene or one protein could be associated with uh, speeding up uh, the, the potential. And uh, the next uh, one could, for example, be that uh, the receiving neuron was slowed down so that the uh, person ended up being normal. <laughs> Now, they have tested uh, these uh, population with uh, different kind of data mining tools with a pure statistical analysis. And uh, nothing was identified. In fact, in the UK, there's a human trust pro project counting about two or 3,000 patients and about 500,000 SNPs. Nothing has been identified. So you can say this is a different approach, selecting uh, only uh, 56 genes and 803 SNPs associated with that uh, disorder. But it, it, it was simply it was necessary to combine not just one or two, but three, four, five, six, seven, eight SNPs at a time to find what are the genotype, what are the combinations which will occur at the at the uh, patients, but not at the controls. What makes those two groups different? So here we're not talking about what is valid or not non-valid. We're talking about uh, comparing a data mine, comparing two populations. The challenge, of course, is that if we are going to select n SNPs out of 803, that number will be pretty large. Uh, so if you're going to search for two, three, four, etc., uh, this is really a challenge. Um, and if, if it was 500,000 steps, it would be even worse. To illustrate a very simple example here, if we're assuming that uh, we have a group of patients and a group of controls and a lot of SNPs, each SNP can be assigned either value 0, 1, or 2. 0 meaning that uh, the uh, variant, the normal um, allele from each parent. 1 meaning that there's a variant uh, allele from one parent, and 2 is that there are variants from both parents. So 2 is rare, while well, uh, the 0 is most common. This is a theoretical example saying, OK, with that uh, SNP S5, we have two for each patient, and it never occurred at the control. OK, then we could say there's a chance here that uh, that SNP, and if you have that uh, variant for both parents, uh, which never occurred at the control, that could be perhaps the SNP causing the disorder. But again, the problem here is that it is not just limited to a single SNP. We have to combine many at a time. So if we take a look at the biological material here and uh, went through all the combinations with three SNPs at a time. OK, three SNPs, that makes uh, uh, three raised to the power of three. That is 27 different genotypes. So the number of genotypes for all those possible combinations of three SNPs is about 2.3 million, oh, billion. And uh, if you count the different subsets, uh, for example, here are uh, uh, the different uh, subgroup of patients which, are, uh, with the, which will never occur at the control group, we'll, for example, see that 13 patients and no control persons, that occur twice. And then I expect, OK, now we have a chance here, because uh, if you look at uh, that, that should be very, very rare that we have 13 patients with a common genotype, and it will never occur at the control group. Now, OK, I, I expect then that we, that could be the, the key here, that, uh, that that could make the difference. And then we tested it by simply doing a permutation of all those individuals, saying now we are selecting 
we are simply making a, a random um, permutation of all indices from one to one thousand or one million nine hundred, and then uh, simply finding some random patients, and then doing the same stuff. But the problem is that uh, even with those permutations, you will find a lot of patient groups. So this is not uh, significant. If we, if we are testing for some uh, one thousand random permutations, it will occur many times that you will find those large patient groups. So that was really uh, bad news. <laughs> we had to redesign the the uh, the theory, and we expect okay, we could not find anything significant. But. There is another thing. If we take a look at the way these patient groups are connected, the symmetries in those patient groups, we can identify some clusters or symmetries in the arrays. Basically, you can say almost that the nature had arrayed itself as an array. But uh, anyway, there are many common um, patient groups, patient group common patients. So. Here I made the requirement that the, the genotype of a given SNP, all the patients must be present in at least one subgroup with at least nine patients. And we also require that there is at least uh, 37 patients associated with that genotype. And uh, I'll show you how it works, but uh, the interesting thing is that we have found four significant clusters, which never occur at the permutation test. Even with 2,000 random permutations, these clusters will never uh, occur. So it seems that uh, this is, from a biological point of view, significant. It is not just uh, uh, random randomness. These uh, four clusters are counting about 170 patients, and there are only 11 of those patients which are common for the clusters. And each cluster is very, very different genotypes. So that means that, okay, it is not just one group of patients, it is four very, very different kind of patients. They have different genotype. They need different kind of, of uh, drugs or med medication. Um, in, in fact, in order to make personalized medicine, you need to uh, go uh, and make a medicine or drug target to that protein in that SNP, uh, rather than just uh, trying. Uh, and that's the problem with many of the disorders. It's uh, the problem, of course, with, the, with, the, with the bipolar disorder. We also know it from some from from breast cancer that uh, the medication uh, which I use is only available or is only active on some 10% of the women. So, so that's really a, a problem. So the vision here, of course, could be if we can identify the SNPs for that subgroup of patients, we, we know the genotype and we know what kind of medication they need exactly because we know what kind of protein it is. Looking at the, the APL array here, this is an example where the first three columns are the SNP indices. I cannot tell you which kind of genes or what kind of SNPs it is. We're going to publish results uh, very soon, but so far you have to limit yourself, with, limit yourself to some indices here. You will see that uh, the SNP with index 702 is present at all the different patient groups. So the SNP 702 has the value or the genotype 2 in, in all these. And, and, uh, and it is reacting with different other kind of, or different other SNPs. But of course, the patients are, are common here. This is another way to present the result. We see that uh, the first genotype defined the cluster A slash XXX. A is the gene, XX is the unknown SNP here. It is uh, present for at uh, 48 patients and 62 controls. And then below we have another uh, cluster, another kind of critical SNP 
which is present at uh, 37 patients and 45 controls. Now, if you look at the first A gene here, it is combined with the E gene, etc. Uh, you can see how it, it is limited further, and, and, uh, and this is important for, you can say, the, the genetic people here, because it is the way the different genes and the different SNPs are combined. How are they reacting with each other? And the key here is that if we had a drug targeted to the A gene and the XXX SNP, uh, it would most likely uh, work on the patients so that they would not be, be sick. We cannot conclude anything yet uh, because we have to test it on further, on larger populations. We have to test it on other uh, people. Uh, this test is done uh, in, in, uh, on population from, from Norway and Denmark, but it is necessary to test the same thing on, on other patients in other areas of the world, because uh, from a genetic point of view, we are not, uh, it could for example be that in, in, uh, in Asia, it is not that uh, SNP or that gene which is causing the disorder, it could be other genes. So the next step now will be to test it on, on, on much larger populations. And uh, that makes the requirements for the p operator and all the exciting stuff from Dialog even more important. Uh, but uh, the things which is happening now is that uh, the, um, the university guys are very excited about this and uh, they want to uh, publish it. We um, have not done very much uh, announcement of this, but in fact we uh, are going to start two new products with two other customers next week. Uh, one of them contacted me a few days ago saying they are working on schizophrenia. And uh, based on a, a population with about uh, 1,200 people, but they are taking into account 500,000 SNPs. So that will really, really be difficult. Uh, but we have to look at it. And here we have the latest uh, cluster. In fact, the, in this case, uh, the DD in here, it is the uh, genotype 1. It's not a genotype 2, it is a genotype 1 representing that it is a variant from just one parent, which makes the difference here. So what we're seeing is that the people are very, very different. There's a very large variation of, of uh, genotypes. In theory, each patient is unique and uh, needs uh, his own medicine. But we hope that we can identify subgroup of patients. Um, these uh, 170 patients, that's just a part of the 700. So we need to find further clusters or further uh, SNPs to, um, to conclude anything. I have made some code uh, myself. Uh, and Morten has taken a close look at this uh, and has made some improvements. Uh, the code focusing on just three SNPs at a time. That was the first generation of the code. Uh, it has been extended now so that we can handle up to eight SNPs at a time and find all clusters up to eight SNPs at a time. But the original code running on uh, the just three SNPs, it, uh, with my code, it took about uh, three minutes uh, on my laptop. And um, then Morten made some improvements of the code. Um, for example, I was, I was using a lot of indexing. And uh, it could be a very good idea to use uh, some more temporary variables, for example. Uh, that made a factor three. <laughs> uh, uh, quite impressive, in fact. So I learned that, OK, sometimes you need to do some experiments and, and know a little bit how the interpreter works. Um, so, uh, but, but Martin made also uh, a test on 12.1, uh, on and uh, the improvement was 25% without doing anything. That was the, uh, the new, I think it is the improvement you have made on, on indexing, et cetera, et cetera, in 12.1. In 
And then using the peach operator, uh, well, it, it made uh, also a difference, but not that much. And the, the reason, of course, is that I'm doing a lot of memory uh, transformations, etc., but not very much computing. Uh, it is slicing, indexing all these arrays, and uh, it seems in this case that the peach operator, okay, it improves, but not that much. Then with the new code, uh, which Morton uh, tried on, uh, okay, uh, the, um, the the step from from 12.1 to 12.1, uh, 12.0 to 12.1 was even better, and uh, the uh, improvements with the piece operator on two cores was also very good. So it's a factor 12 effect by these uh, combinations of code review and uh, the new version of data. I suppose that uh, we, or I'm, I'm pretty much sure that we, rather than using multi-core uh, in this area, we, we should use uh, several computers and use the pizza race on, on various computers to improve the scalability and the performance of this. 52 seconds uh, on the 12 zero, um, and down to 15 seconds, that means that if we're going to make uh, 1,000 permutations to do the Monte Carlo test, it will take about four hours. That, that's okay, that's not a, a big problem. But if we, uh, again, are going to take a look at, at many, many more snips at a time and do the same kind of Monte Carlo test with 1,000 permutations, uh, it can take a <clears throat> very long time. So uh, we need now to, well, think about how to use uh, the dialog and the new dialog product for distributed computing uh, on many computers uh, doing uh, the same operations. In fact, we also made some study together with the Technical University of Denmark where we had, they had tried to use a, a graphical processor, a GPU, because uh, rather than red, green, blue, uh, here we're talking about the zeros one. Uh, zero, 0.1.2, two. So uh, this simple kind of uh, searching for these integers can, in fact, uh, it can be implemented using a, a GPU. And here the, f the factor was about 50. Uh, so using a GPU for this kind of very, very specialized uh, moving on, 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 on integers here, it seems, it seems to be an opportunity, but I don't know yet which uh, tool we'll use. Now, the interesting thing about this, it is very important, it is very interesting to find the, the genes causing that disorder. But if we can find the genes and we can identify the proteins involved, uh, that's important for the drug development. The fact that they can uh, uh, develop the drugs specialized to a given subgroup of patients. Uh, we have been contacted by one of the, the big uh, drug uh, developers uh, of pharmaceutical industries uh, in Denmark, and um, their process is a little bit different. Uh, what they are interested in is uh, rather than developing uh, 10 new uh, drugs for that kind of patients, they want to identify the genotype so that the, the, when they are developing a new drug and uh, are going to test it with the clinical trials, uh, rather than testing on, on anybody, uh, it's more, it's much more, uh, it's much better to be specific and go for a given uh, subgroup with, with a given genotype. That could perhaps save uh, a year's development. So um, the commercial aspects, of course, is that it is interesting for the drug industry, for drug development. It's interesting for the researchers. Uh, it could also be interesting for personalized genetics. There are already today some websites in the U.S. where you can uh, send your blood and then you get the DNA profile and then you can see you are, are you likely to get that disease, etc. Uh, but again, they are looking at single SNPs. If they are going to conclude more, they should um, combine the SNPs and test the combinations. 
And in the future, perhaps, we could perhaps imagine that uh, in the treatment of, uh, of people that uh, you give your DNA profile when you're at the hospital, and then they know exactly what kind of medicine you need. This is not just a question about data mining from a technological, technological point of view. It's also a question about uh, the constraints, because these various uh, drugs or components of drugs must be combined. Uh, if, you, uh, if you have already received that kind of uh, medicine, you cannot, uh, it cannot be combined with other kinds of medicine. So in order to uh, simplify this drug development, it's also important to support the rule-based uh, approach we talked about uh, before. So we really need the, uh, the peach operator. We, there are really no requirements for, for large-scale uh, problems here on the dialogue front. So as I see it, we need to build the new tools, not in C++, but in Dialog. And um, now there are new customers, and uh, I think we can show momentum. We also talked about making cooperation between Array and Dialog to uh, build the tool together. We need the support from Dialog. Um, and uh, also, uh, of course, to uh, extend the technology to the constraint engine so that we have a dialog tool for data mining and a dialog tool for the constraint part of it. So that is the slide we saw before, the two uh, parallel tracks. So <clears throat> it's no secret that I see the, um, the use of APL and the use of arrays for parallel processing is what, what could be an eye-opener for other kind of developers. Because it seems to be easy to, to do this kind of parallel programming. Uh, because if you can define your problem from an array point of view and arrange it geometrically, it should be easier to, uh, to do this parallel approach. And it seems that, I've not tested it yet, but uh, it seems that using the PEATS operator and the original each operator, it could be easy for developers to, to do some tests uh, whether or not it is an advantage to use the PEATS. Okay, that was my major topic. Are there any questions? Yeah. I, I gather from your presentation that you've been in developing this software, both the domain expert and the program. Uh, the latest product here? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I wonder, can I invite you to speculate on how your work would have gone if you had to work with somebody else doing the program? <laughs> yeah, you can say that the way. Uh, the way uh, I have used APL in a product like, like this, the latest one here, is that, okay, the, the, the professor at the university here has a problem, and we try to do some tests in APL, fast prototyping. It doesn't work. Then we try something else. He has another theory. We try that. Uh, it is impossible to make uh, a specification of a software tool for this kind. You have to getting started with some data, uh, and then do the tests and see what happens, and uh, and simply use the the APL, the dialog as a mathematical notation. Do the prototyping, see what what's come up here, and uh, and that's the way we have uh, used it uh, in the entire process, in a close dialog with the domain expert, because I'm not a domain expert in genetics nor biology. Um, but the close uh, dialogue with the, 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 the domain expert, and then uh, a lot of prototyping, uh, that's the way we have uh, succeeded with this project. Of course, then the next step would be to commercialize a product. And that could be other kind of, uh, people should do that. Um, I'm not necessarily the best one to do that, uh, but uh, rather than, that's what we did before. We said, okay, now we could do it in C++. 
That was we did that with the first generation of the, of the constraint engine. It was prototyped in APL, and then it was rewritten in C++. But still, the APL code is faster. Okay, it cannot be embedded. It cannot be used for the embed solution we wanted to. But um, I'm very excited about this way to do prototyping as a way to, to develop new things. What we know is only from from uh, what is written. Uh, I've not made an analysis of all the competitors. There's a lot of competition. Uh, if you look at all the articles uh, written about uh, genotyping and SNP analysis, uh, it seems that China is very much in the front right now. Uh, China is really pushing hard to, to uh, get results on this front. Uh, but um, the latest articles we, we see is that uh, this kind of combinatorial analysis of SNPs, uh, it's, it's, for example, there was an article here uh, a few months ago saying it, it is impossible to do combinatorial tests because it will blow up in size. It is, it's simply impossible to do a combinatorial analysis. We have to do it statistically. But well, the problem is that the pure statistical, uh, statistical analysis is not sufficient. You have to combine uh, uh, or do the, the, the combinatorial analysis or the geometrical analysis combined with the, the significance test. So, um, well, yeah, yeah, I hope, I think, I think that there could be a window which is open now, <laughs> but it can be closed in a few weeks. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no. And uh, what I've seen uh, is that some of the big companies um, are very excited about our solution and uh, now want us to uh, get involved. And they are more experts than, than I am or the university uh, people. But um, so we're going to make new products, uh, commercial products on, on this front. So, well, it, it could be an opportunity, yes. Yeah. Um, sort of a follow up to your hybrid solution of combinatorial analysis and statistical significance testing. If I recall, you said before about four SNP types that were not duplicated in a thousand Monte Carlo runs in, in the control population in the two thousand? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It never occurred. Did it, did it well you could say that's a very good result, or you could say, I haven't observed it. Did, did anybody suggest keep running the Monte Carlo until you see those SNPs as a result of the random uh, combinations so that you get a confidence interval on how good your Monte Carlo simulation? Yeah. Uh, the next step, of course, will be to do even more um, uh, permutations uh, on, on larger populations. So that that's necessary. We, we, we cannot conclude anything about that. We have a breakthrough in, in discovering the uh, SNPs uh, causing that disorder. That we cannot conclude anything. We can just say, OK, uh, it seems promising. We need now to test it on further, on larger populations, and uh, with more SNPs, perhaps, or more genes, because these 50, 16 are selected, selected uh, from, from this uh, uh, theory about the signal transmission in the brain, but uh, it could very well be other genes involved. So um, we cannot conclude anything else that uh, the university and the other people need another product. Um, so we hope to get further uh, data now for further testing. 
Uh, there's another group uh, in, in Denmark working on, as I said, schizophrenia, and they have a much, much larger uh, data available. Uh, they have uh, about 1,000 uh, people, but uh, they have access to databases with about 1.2 million uh, people with that uh, disorder. Schizophrenia is a very, very uh, serious uh, kind of disorder, and there's a lot of uh, interest in, in, in finding the genes causing schizophrenia. It costs us the, uh, a lot of money with all these uh, people getting schizophrenia. Yes? Is there the possibility of partnering with some research group that has identified a protein that is the cause of the disease that already has that SNP data prepared and taking that, looking at your system and confirming, you know, that you know the result of it. Yeah. That's a very good idea. How long does it take you to prepare and get all the data and get cleaned up and get to long you can see, it, testing the data and, and testing on it is, is not that complicated. You can see it's also very simple data uh, structure. We have two tables with uh, patients and controls, and, and all the SNPs are 0, 1, 2. Uh, it's the number of combinations which is the challenge. Um, but um, yes, uh, we, we, uh, it would be obvious to, to use all those data available for example, from, from the human, human Trust in the UK, where they also have a lot of patients with bipolar disorder, and, and testing the data on this. But before you know that there is a gene, that, like the breast cancer gene, that has a couple yeah. of things that you can take the SNPs, so yeah. look, yeah, that, that could be an interesting approach. OK, saying that they have the theory that that uh, SNP with that genotype could be a risk factor. Um, and then uh, testing whether it's, it generates a, a, a cluster. And that, that's, you can say, the new thing here is that uh, it is not sufficient just to take talking about uh, subgroup of patients because there's, uh, it's a very uh, homogeneous uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, genotyping here. There's a lot of different genotypes, a lot of different uh, uh, subgroup of patients. What makes it, uh, what seems to make it unique here, is this clustering. So it's not just random. It, it's a really, it's really, uh, at least with the first 2,000 permutations, uh, with that population, we, we, we need, so of course, more. But that's a very good idea. Okay. Thank you.